Well, let me drop you into the middle of first century Ephesus. You are in a large multi-ethnic capital city. It's a center of trade, commerce, and culture. 250,000 people pack into this urban city center and call it home. Only Rome and Alexandria have more population or influence. Sailors from all over the world get off their ships down at the docks of this fast-paced strategic sea harbor. The streets of Ephesus are crowded. They're lined with gorgeous Greek architecture and cutting edge infrastructure. The city has become a commercial cosmopolitan center for arts and science and entertainment. People are drawn to Ephesus from all over the world. If ancient Rome was New York, then Ephesus is LA. A feat. LA is world famous for the Hollywood sign. Ephesus is world famous for the temple Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The temple was dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis. She was goddess of fertility. And as such, Ephesus became a city that was mired in demonic uh, dark arts, sexual deviancy and fantasy, all in worship of Artemis. A large travel industry developed around the temple of Artemis the cult that was there. There was this attraction from all over the empire. Think Disneyland with religious cultish intensity. Although if you go to Disneyland, you'll see religious cultish intensity. (laughs) Vacationers to Ephesus would go home with a collection of souvenirs, small wooden statues of Artemis with gold stickers on the bottom that said made in Ephesus. Ephesus was a college town, a buzzing college town with a prestigious medical university, renowned doctors, and a large public library. There was a cutting edge underground sewer system and an outdoor amphitheater that seated more people than the Hollywood Bowl seats today. Affluent homes in Ephesus boasted split level construction, often exceeding 10,000 square feet. Ephesus boasted amazing opulence. When you think of Ephesus, don't think of a small, dusty town with a dirt street and a few camels tied up. Think LA, think Atlanta, think right here. Here's a historical rendering of what many scholars and theologians think Ephesus potentially looked like. It was a gorgeous Greek Roman city, massive Colosseum. You can see what they believe the temple Artemis may have looked like before it was torn to the ground. Massive structure, nearly two to three times the Pantheon in Rome. You can see today the Ephesian theater and how glorious it is. You can see the view that overlooks the sea. And you can even see the ruins of the Ephesian library that are still standing today. This is what's left of it after it was besieged by the Goths. When you think of Ephesus, you've got to think with a modern mind. You've got to think with innovative eyes. Ephesians is not a letter that is written to uneducated prehistoric people who are out of touch with reality. This letter is written to influencers, to movers and shakers, to doctors and travelers, students and scientists, cultured people living in a fast paced, progressive urban city center where they're trying to make it in the big city. This letter is written to people just like you. And me. Written between 60 and 60 AD, Ephesians is one of the Apostle Paul's prison letters written from Rome. Outside of Paul's letter to the Romans, Ephesians is the most dense, theologically rich book of Paul's. In the book of Ephesians, we see it is also one of Paul's most controversial letters outside of Romans. It has been loved and celebrated and debated for centuries. It's often people's favorite book of the Bible, including John Calvin, John Knox, church fathers, Orgian and Jerome. It is highly praised. The church father Christosom called it sublime. Modern New Testament scholars have called it one of the most significant documents ever written. Doctrine is set to music, the crown of St. Paul's writings, theological gold and the greatest piece of writing in all of history. 
packed in this very short letter is the longest run on sentence in the Bible, the greatest prayer in the Bible, not prayed by Jesus, the second clearest picture of the gospel in all of scripture, one of the most read scriptures at weddings, the clearest, the deepest insight into the secret mystery of the plan of God and the famous biblical weapons arsenal known as the armor of God. But at its core, Ephesians is about one thing. Ephesians is about identity. Ephesians is all about knowing the power of who you really are. I wonder today, for those in the big city living fast paced lives with a million moving parts, do you want to know today who you really are? Likely written to new young Christians who were being drawn back in by the enticing Ephesian culture and tempted to go back to their former sinful lifestyles, Paul writes to explain to these new young Christians that their new true identity is so much better than anything they'd be able to find back in Ephesus. I hope today the same comes true for you. I hope that what you find here and what you find in the word of God, you find to be so much better and so much more powerful than anything you can find out there in the world or on here, your phone, but that you would see and that you would know the power of who you really are. From now till Easter, we're gonna try to get everything that we can out of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And you're going to see that right from the start in Ephesians 1, Paul goes off. Paul goes off. If you were to look at it in the Greek, verses 3 to 23 are one long run on sentence. No periods, no pauses. All you grammar Nazis would lose your mind. Paul can't say this loud enough. Paul can't say this fast enough. Uh, John C. Kirby described Paul as being in a state of controlled ecstasy. The writing style communicates urgency and poetry and intensity. Can't say it fast enough. Can't say it loud enough. And the sentiment is that there are not enough words to capture the power of knowing who you really are. In the first 14 verses alone, we're called some crazy things. They're going to come up on the screen. We are called saints and faithful, blessed with every spiritual blessing, chosen, holy, blameless, loved, predestined, adopted, sons, redeemed, forgiven, lavished, ones within an inheritance, the praise of his glory and sealed. In just first 14 verses, Paul goes, this is who you are. You are chosen and you are loved and you are blameless and you are adopted, redeemed, forgiven, lavish. You've got an inheritance. You are the praise of God's glory. Now, as you look at that list today, you may find yourself thinking, well, I sure don't feel like it. I sure don't feel like that is who I am. That doesn't feel like my identity. A saint, I'm not a saint. Blameless, I'm not blameless. Forgiven, I don't feel forgiven. Adopted, I actually feel all alone. Chosen, no, no one's chosen me. No one's picked me. Well, all of those words, the apostle Paul would actually say come together in two words. There are two words that make all of those words a reality for you and for me. Two words that Paul uses to tie all of those words together. Two words that change everything for the Ephesians and two words that can change everything for you and me. Two words that stand at the center of identity. Two words that are the greatest mystery in all of theology. If I could only tell you two words to help you understand your true identity, I would tell you these two words, just two words. Think for a second about the power of two words. I do love you, marry me, I'm pregnant. The end, game over. Now that may or may not be the sequential order of what happens when you have kids. I'm pregnant, the end, game over. But I'm here to tell you today that these two words 
are more powerful than all of those words put together. These two words change everything. These two words that Paul uses encapsulate the most important theological doctrine that you may never even heard of. These two words bring about more mystery and security and vitality than any others. These two words heal what's broken. They reconcile races. They transcend categories, make enemies, friends, join nations, heal marriages, free addicts, and restore families. Anyone want to know what these two words are? These two words are in Christ. In Christ. Can we say that together? In Christ. Can you say it again a little louder? In Christ. On the count of three, can you say it like you just won the lottery? One, two, three. In Christ. I want for you to know that those two words are better than winning the lottery. It, if you really understand what those two words mean for you, how those two words change you, you would understand that it's better to be in Christ than to be in the honeymoon phase. It's better to be in Christ than to be in love. It's better to be in Christ than to be in a marriage. It's better to be in Christ than to be in a millionaire's club. It's better to be in Christ than be in Cabo. I said it. It's better to be in Christ than to be in your dream job or living in your dream house or in your dream neighborhood or in your dream city. Being in Christ is better than anything. Being in Christ is better than everything. Paul pens this letter to people living in one of the greatest cities in the world to tell them that the truest thing about them is no longer that they're Ephesians living in Ephesus, but that they are Christians living in Christ. In all of its forms, just wrap your mind around this. The words in Christ, in him, in whom, in the beloved, in Christ Jesus occurs over 200 times in the New Testament. 40 of those times show up in the book of Ephesians. Like now that I've told you this today, you're not going to be able to unsee this throughout the pages of scripture. You're gonna see that in Christ, in him, in whom, in the beloved is everywhere and it is core to everything in Christ. And because I'm fired up today, I'm gonna to teach you to see it in the Old Testament too. From the very first words of the Bible, in Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the beginning, God. Last words of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, the fifth to last word, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, amen. Almost bookends from beginning to end in Jesus. I would contend today that the entire Bible is one gigantic story about the difference of life in Jesus or life outside of Jesus. The offer is that there is this exchange that can take place where you can move from the outside to the inside and it can change everything. The whole of the Bible from word number one being in is a big part of the biblical story. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were in a garden called Eden. They got kicked out. Noah had to get in an ark. Abraham was in covenant with God. Moses is trying to get out of slavery in Egypt and into freedom in the promised land. God dwells in the ark, in the cloud by day, in the fire by night, in the still small voice, in the holy of holies where only one person once a year can go in. In, in, in. Nehemiah rebuilds the wall so people can be safe in the city. People go into exile in Babylon and they have to step in the Jordan for the rivers to part. But as you make your way to the New Testament, you realize that all of those things are allegories and shadows of the one thing we must ultimately find ourselves in, which is in Christ Jesus. Listen to me today, Jesus is the ark we get into that carries us above the waters and delivers us from the wrath of God. Jesus is the whale that we get swallowed in, carrying us to our destiny, even when we want to run. Jesus is the holy of holies and in him, we experience the fullness of God's presence. 
Jesus is the city we live in with indestructible walls. This is the message of the Bible and this is God's heart for you. I want for you to think for a second about the way that the things that you're in have an actual effect and change upon you. How what you're in affects the way that you see yourself and the way that others see you. So think about this for a second. If you see someone in a Porsche, it changes the way that you think about them, doesn't it? You see someone in a Porsche versus in a Hopti, it changes the way that you think about them. You look at them differently based upon what they're in. Like if you see someone in some Skechers, like that's saying something, right? If you see someone in something, it can change. So you know this is true about yourself. How many of you by show of hands have a, have a pair of favorite jeans? Like some jeans that you, yes, you know you do. You know what they are right now. And how many of you know that if you're in those jeans, it changes you? Like you just feel better about yourself. Like you look at, you got some extra confidence. You got some extra swagger. Like you, you like the way that you look. Being in something can change you. If you are in a trailer or in a mansion, it makes you feel different. Being in things changes you. It changes you. It affects you. So, so let's do it like this. You're lonely, but then you're in a relationship. You're single, but then you fall in love. You're a refugee, but then you're in the United States. You're sick, but then you get in treatment. You're drowning, but then you get pulled in the boat. You're wet and cold, but then you get brought in the house. Getting in changes you. This is exactly what Paul is saying to those living in Ephesus. When you get in Christ, Christ changes you. You may come into him wet and cold and drowning and lonely, but give him time and being in him will change you. The fiery warmth of his presence will change you from the inside out. Ephesians chapter one, verse one, Paul says it like this, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now notice that he gives an identity statement before he gives a location statement. It's almost as if being in Jesus has transformed these people into something else that changes where they are. So they're in Ephesus, but they're no longer primarily Ephesians. They are saints first all because they are in Christ. Now, when you see that word saints, I'm sure you think to yourself, not me. I don't feel like a saint. Like a lot of this is due to the influence of the Catholic church that they're, you know, kind of your run of the mill Christians. And then there are these varsity level Christians who are saints. And being a saint is just reserved for the super pious, the extremely religious, the sacrificial, those who go above and beyond. Like we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, people who serve in children's ministry. Like they are saints. And then the rest of us, we're just like JV Christians. But the scriptures say that you are a saint. As you read the Bible, what's very interesting is how liberally the scriptures use this word. Even even Paul calls the church at Corinth, those crazy Corinthians, a bunch of saints. They're getting drunk on communion wine and Paul calls them saints. Saints. Because your identity isn't found in what you do. It is found by who you are in. And in Christ Jesus, you become what you once were. They are saints before they're in Ephesus because they are in Christ. Being in Christ matters more than where you're from. Being in Christ matters more than the house you live in, more than the job you're in, the relationship you're in, the trouble you're in, the debt you're in, the stress you're under. Ephesians 1, 3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just try to hold this reality in your mind that there is not a blessing in heaven that is not yours in Jesus Christ. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. God's not holding out on you. There's nothing that he is kind of like, you know, put on reserves and it's just reserved for someone else. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is yours in Jesus. 
This means that the world can take your money and it can take your health and it can take your job and it can take your mind. It can take your body and it can take your hair. It can take your innocence and it can take your childhood. It can take your strength and your momentary happiness. But if you're in Christ, it cannot touch your eternal inheritance. For those in Christ, there are these spiritual realities that one day will become physical realities spiritual guarantees that one day will become physical ones. Like we get to participate right now today in things internally and spiritually in our minds and in our souls that one day we will receive fully in the flesh. It won't be an imaginary throne, but a literal one that you'll sit on. There won't just be internal peace, but external peace. There'll be no more wars. You won't just have the joy of your salvation, you will have the happiness of your salvation. We see into a dim mirror now, but one day we will know as we are fully known, but only by being in Christ. Only by being in Christ. Every part of our present and future identity comes true. Christ is the conduit that all other identities flow through. Christ is the key that unlocks all these other treasures. Being in Christ is what makes all of this come true. Ephesians 1, 1 through 13, look at it. Like you're not gonna be able to unsee it after this. It's coming up on the screen. Ephesians 1, 1 through 13. I'll do it for you. 1, 1 through 13, there it is. All right, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful, let's say it together, in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He chose us. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. He has blessed us. We have redemption through his blood, the mystery of his will, which he set forth to unite all things. In him, we have obtained inheritance so that we who were the first to hope might be to the praise of his glory. You also, when you heard the word of truth and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It's the key that unlocks everything. It's not a question of what you've done or where you've been or what you feel. It's a question today of whether or not you are in him. You see, your emotions would love to lie to you and your experience would love to distract you and make you believe that you are not who God says that you are. But the question that you must ask is not what I've done or what I have been or where I have been or what mistakes I have made, but am I in Christ? Faithful, blessed, chosen, graced, redeemed, forgiven, included, known, marked, sealed. You get it all when you get in Jesus. I want for you to think for a second about getting into college. Now, for some of you guys, you're like, that was a long time ago, brother. When you got in college, you applied and you were accepted and then you got in. And you got that letter in the mail and it did something on your insides. And all of the benefits that were attached to that school, the accolades and the credentials, the prestige, the resources, the faculty, even the school's name got attached to you. When you're in that school, in a sense, you become that school. So when you were accepted into UGA, you say, I am a Georgia Bulldog. When you get accepted into Georgia Tech, you say, I am a Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket. When you get accepted into Harvard, you say, I am a nerd, <laughs> but a rich nerd. You, in a sense, become everything that that school is identified with. So when you get into a school, you become a part of that school. You are identified with that school. And the things that happen to that school, in a sense, happen to you. So if your school wins the national championship, if they take home the trophy, what do you say? You say, we are national champions. Now, let's just be real with ourselves. You didn't play a game. You didn't address out. You weren't on the sideline. You weren't even Bobby Boucher from Waterboy. <laughs> you did a whole lot of nothing. 
But nonetheless, we say it. We are national champions. That is the gospel. You did nothing. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't work for it. You didn't try for it. You weren't good enough to compete for it. Jesus put the team on his back and he carried the cross up the hill and he took upon the sin of the world in him and he died the death that you deserve to die. And he gloriously, victoriously resurrected from the grave. And he credits to you everything that he earned in himself if you are in him. This is the good news of the gospel. Being in Christ refers to our position. We might say that we are in a house or in a car. And when we do, we are specifying an enclosing object. And so if I'm in a car, then whatever that car is, I am as well. Whatever happens to that car, in a sense, also happens to me. So I'll say, I got in a wreck or I got in an accident. And so it is with being in Christ. I'm enclosed by him. I'm protected by him. I'm shielded in him. His experiences, in a sense, become my experiences. But it wasn't always this way. Apart from Christ, the Bible says that you and I are in Adam. Everyone is in Adam. Adam, the first human being ever. If, if you want to get really technical about this, and apparently I do, even biologically, sexually, all future humans are in Adam, coming out of Adam. All of humanity was in him. So when Adam sins, what happens to Adam happens to all of humanity because all of humanity is in him, in Adam. So what is true of Adam is true about us. We are in sin, in judgment, kicked out of Eden, cut off from relationship with God and under his righteous judgment. You today feel this. You sense this. This is most of your lived experience that you feel like I am in Adam. I'll never forget seeing an illustration that made me, um, made this come to life for me and I, I never forgot it. So, this is you and you're going about your life, you're living it every day and you're doing the things that you said you would never do and you're not doing the things that you know that you're supposed to do, but this is you. And the reason that is, is because you were born in Adam, which means that you were born into a sinful world. So there you are living your life and the reason that you don't do the things that you should do and you do the things that you know that you shouldn't do is because you were born in sin. You live in a sinful world. Genesis 3 tells us that the curse of Adam has cursed everyone. And so our primary enclosure, the thing that we are in is in a world that is fractured by sin. But it's much worse than that. It's not just that we are in sin. The Bible says that we actually have hearts that are full of sin, that sin is in us too. So the reason that you can change environments, you can change friends and you can change neighborhoods, but you can't change your habits. And wherever you go, there you are. And you think it's gonna be a new year and you're gonna be a different person only to find that it's the new year, but you're the same person. It's because we don't just live in a world that is broken and affected by sin, but sin lives in us. Sin lives in our heart like a cancer, distorting our vision of the world, contaminating us from the inside out. We live in a sinful world and sin lives in us. It's trapped in us, it's closed up in us and there's nothing that we can do about it. There's no way to break out of it. There's no way that I am getting out of there on my own. And we can do all that we want to try to fix the problem. Like you could take that daily declaration that I gave you last week and you could throw that in there. Shoot, you could even take the Bible and you put it in there, right? And all that you are now is you are in sin with the Bible. 
That's it. You're still, you're still in sin. Now, what a lot of us would love to do is we take people who have sin in them and who are in sin and we just, we try to massage it and we say, oh, sweet girl. Oh, honey, darling, you're just precious. and You can be good. To, oh, girl, you just, oh, queen, slay. And we try to do all these things to make people who are in sin, with sin in them, feel better about themselves, but they know. They know it doesn't matter how much self-help, they, don't know, they know it doesn't matter how much self-talk, nothing can change what is inside of them in the world that they live inside of. And so God, in his great, extravagant, lavish, incredible, amazing love for us, sent his son, Jesus, to break into this world of sin. And he came to change the script, to take this sinful world and to create a new creation so that those who would receive Jesus, Jesus came and he lived the life that we couldn't live and he died the death that we couldn't die. He was born of a virgin, so he wasn't born into sin. He wasn't in Adam. That's the miraculous nature of the virgin birth is that the sin that passes to you and me doesn't pass to Jesus. So Jesus comes and he lives the perfect life and he dies the vicarious death so that we could break out of that sinful world and so that we could find ourselves in Jesus. We could become new creations who are no longer in this fractured world by sin. But you know what? There's this problem is that sin is still in us. And this is the power, the glorious power of the gospel is that he doesn't just come to get us out of the sinful world. He comes to get sin out of us. And Jesus doesn't just say that we are in Jesus, but that Jesus is in us. That somehow through the Holy Spirit, God would come and he would live on our inside. So you in Christ, Christ in you, making you a new creation from the inside out, changing how you see the world. But it's even better than that because the scriptures would say that we are actually in Christ and Christ is in us, but that our life is hidden in God. That something happens to a Christian. And if you follow Jesus, maybe you've experienced this where your life doesn't make sense to the outside world, where you do things that don't fit in with this modern society. You don't vote like they vote. You don't think like they think. You don't spend your money like they spend their money. You don't view success the way that they view it. You don't view sex the way that they view it. You view life different. And so your life doesn't always seem to make sense. And you sometimes get passed over and don't feel like you fit in. And that's because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And you are, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now here's the glorious scripture. The Bible says that when Christ appears, you will also appear with him in glory. That one day you will be what you, what you do not yet see yourself as. That one day the things that you know are true or you want to know are true, they will actually be evidently visibly true. That there's actually this identity that God has been hiding that one day he will reveal to all of creation what the sons of God are actually like. This is what it means to be in Christ. For Christ to be in you. For your life to be hidden with Christ in God. For sin to be no more. This means that you're no longer in sin. You're in Christ you're no longer in bondage, you're in Christ. You're no longer in judgment, you're in Jesus. You're no longer in wrath, you're under mercy. You're no longer in guilt, you are in God. Being in Christ is like being in a city with walls that will never fail. Being in Christ is like being in an ocean with waves of love that never stop. You know, you can get off Tinder when you know you're in Christ. And you can let go of your past when you know you're in Christ. And you don't have to be in the in crowd when you're in Christ. You don't have to be cool on Instagram when you're in Christ. I am in Christ, so I am in his family. Just think about this. I am in Christ, so I am on his payroll. I am in Christ, so I'm under his covering. I am in his presence. I am on his mind. I am in Christ, so he gives me nourishment like a baby in their mother's womb. I'm in Christ, so he lifts me up like a boat in the waves. I'm in Christ, so he protects me like a soldier in armor. Christ is my fortress. Christ is my clothes. No matter what else I am surrounded by, I am in 
Christ, when God looks at you, he sees the blood of Jesus covered over you. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. You're in Jesus. So he treats you as he treats Jesus, talks to you as he talks to Jesus, rewards you as he rewards Jesus, loves you as he loves Jesus. This, this would, if this can move from your head to your heart today, if this theological reality could take root in your life, it would unlock freedom and worship and confidence and peace. Most of us are so, struggle so hard to believe that God actually loves us because we look into our lives and we find ourselves unlovable. But God does not love you based upon you. God loves you because you are in Jesus. So when he sees you, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your mistakes. He sees his son covering you, surrounding you. Just rest in that for a second. God sees Jesus when he sees me. That means when God sees me, he sees someone who's obedient. When God sees me, he sees someone who's faithful. When God sees me, he sees someone who's generous. When God sees me, he sees someone who's in his family. When God sees me, he sees me as someone who overcomes. When God sees me, he sees me as he sees Jesus. Jerry Bridges says, for every look you take at yourself in your daily experience, take two looks at who you are in Christ. Every time you look at yourself and you, you think I'm not there yet, and I've stumbled and I've fallen, and I'm so messed up, take two looks at who you are in Christ and remember that is what's most true about you. Now this poses one giant question today, doesn't it? How in the world do I get in Christ? How do I make that my identity? How do I get out of sin and how do I get sin out of me and how do I get into Christ and how do I get Christ into me so that I might be hidden in God so that when Christ who is my life appears, I will also appear with him in glory. We get in Christ through faith in the gospel. You get in Christ through faith in the gospel. Ephesians 1, 7 says it like this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So in him we have redemption. In Christ we have redemption. So I want for you to think about the fact that it's through Jesus that we get redeemed. And I want for you to think about a company getting redeemed, getting bought back, getting reconciled, getting purchased, okay? So imagine that your life is a company and your company is drowning in debt. You've had no sales in months. You're bleeding cash. You're in debt up to your eyeballs. And this other company comes in that's killing it, making cash hand over fist, expanding into new markets and territories. And they say, this little company that is draining cash and that's in debt up to its eyeballs, I wanna buy this company and bring it into my company. That company would redeem this, would buy it back and would assume all the debts, all of the payments, all of the past due bills would now become the new company's responsibility. And in Jesus, that's what happens. Through the blood of Jesus, we get forgiven for every debt, every trespass, every miscalculation, every mistake. That comes into him. And it happens as a gift of his grace. Not because you earned it or deserved it or because he saw what this company could someday be. All out of a gift of himself. Ephesians 1.3, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance. This is what makes Christianity just unbelievably mind boggling that God supernaturally through the Holy Spirit would allow us to come into Christ and Christ to come into us all based upon our faith, our faith, our belief, 
our belief in the reality that Christ is Christ, that Christ is the Messiah, that Christ is the Son of God, that He is the one who the Father has sent to be the Savior of the world. If you would believe that you are in sin and that sin is in you, but that in Jesus is perfection and life and life to the full, and that he lived the life that you could not live and that he died the death that you deserve to die and that he resurrected from the grave to pay for your sins and you would trust in him. You would pledge allegiance to him. You would look upon him, throw yourself into him. Then Christ would come and live in you. Let me tell you today that it is possible to be in church, but not in Christ. It's possible to be in religion, but not in Christ. It's like you can be at the airport, but miss, but, but miss your airplane. You can be at the airport, but miss your airplane. And a lot of people grow up in church and around church, but they totally miss Jesus. They totally miss what it means for their life to be fully connected, surrounded, encompassed by him and in him. For them to think every day that I'm living this life in this broken world, but not of this broken world, I'm living in Jesus. Like you can go to equip, you can be in equip and you can be on the dream team and you can be in base camp and you can be in a small group, but you can miss being in Christ. You see, all of those are terminals connecting you to Jesus, the airplane that takes you to your destiny, which is life in him with him, knowing him, talking to him. Every moment of every second, of every hour, of every day, you have an opportunity to live in your destiny by communing with the God who you are in and who is in you. Are you experiencing union with Christ, abiding relationship with Christ? And is that relationship changing you? I am no longer an independent agent. I am included in something much greater than myself. Our identity in Jesus becomes the fundamental identity that claims every other identity, identity we could possibly have. Jesus will not be an accessory to your identity. He will not just be a necklace that you wear. He will not just be a sideshow. He says, I will be in you and you can be in me, but I want to come and get everything. I want to own you, transform you, redefine you, and lead you into the life that I died so that you could experience. Now, I wanna talk in closing today about becoming what you already are. Because as you hear some of this today, that you are in Christ and Christ is in you and your life is hidden in God and that when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. And that being in Christ means that God looks at you the way that he looks at his son. And that being in Christ means that you have access to everything that Christ has access to and that you can be who Christ is right now, presently today, because he is living in you and you are living in him. And you're going, Joey, it sure doesn't feel like that. I wanna talk to you about living into who you already are. On June 29th, 2012, all my dreams came true when I married my wife, Kayla Michelle McLaughlin. Now, yeah, I know you're cheering in that picture for her and not for your boy, right? Now, we have come a long way since that day to just show you the thrill of my excitement. I've got another picture of just how excited I was. I tricked her. That's what that fist bump is right there. And on that day, almost 12 years ago, Kayla and I stood in front of our family and friends and God, and we pledged our allegiance to each other. And we legally got married. She trusted me. I trusted her and we vowed to one another. And as the Bible says, that day, two people became one. I'm no longer Joey McLaughlin and she is no longer Kayla Williams. Together we are the McLaughlin family. She is mine, I am hers. And the journey of our marriage has been a progressive one. Today, I would say that everything that's mine is Kayla's. And everything that's Kayla's is Kayla's. 
Just kidding, just kidding. Everything that's Kayla's is mine as well. We share everything. We share money, we share our time, we share our schedule. She has access to everything in my life, every password, every bank account. She knows, she knows everything. There's nothing she doesn't know. We are one. Today, I make almost no decision in my life without thinking about its effect upon Kayla. I think about what she's gonna think about it, how it's gonna make her feel. I don't say yes to something at work without thinking and considering Kayla. I don't make plans to go play basketball without considering Kayla. I don't say yes to a poker night without first talking to Kayla. I don't go on vacation without talking to Kayla. I don't spend money over like $25 without first talking to Kayla. Everything in my life is connected to everything in her life. And today our marriage is incredible and wonderful and there is depth and honesty. But don't you know, it wasn't what it is today, 12 years ago. 12 years ago, I was not the husband that I am today. 12 years ago, I was much more selfish. 12 years ago, I was much more prideful. 12 years ago, I had a shorter temper. 12 years ago, I allowed my ambition to distort the way that I saw her and I had unhealthy habits that caused me to make unwise decisions. But 12 years ago, was I married to Kayla? I sure was. I was just as married to Kayla 12 years ago as I am today, but my experience of that marriage is much different today than it was 12 years ago. And there's some of you who have believed the lie that you're somehow not in the family of God because you've not gotten the experience of what you think it should be like. And I just wanna tell you this morning to hold on and to fight the good fight and to remind yourself of those vows that you've made, the ones that you made to Jesus, but more importantly, the one that Jesus made to you to seal you with the gift of his spirit and to say that I've taken residence within you and there's not a single thing that can rip me away. And realize that this is a journey, a progressive journey of living every day into who we already are. So I wanna close by reading this daily declaration over you that we rolled out last week and that we'll continue to add to throughout this series, but that I'm praying you realize if you're in Jesus, if you've put your faith in Him, this is who you already are. This isn't self-help, positive vibes, or a little pick-me-up. This is war against the schemes of the enemy. I say this every day out loud to take hold of what is already mine in Jesus. I say this to live into my true identity. I say this so I don't forget. I'm not what the world says about me. I'm not the lies that have been spoken over me. I'm not the sum of all my achievements or my mistakes. I am who God says I am. I am first and foremost a beloved child who God is pleased with. God doesn't just love me, God really likes me. I am in Christ, blessed with every spiritual blessing. I don't need the treasures of this world. I have an eternal inheritance. I refuse to believe the lies. I will not forfeit my destiny. This is who I am and am becoming. The truest thing about me is that I'm a child of the one true King.